Is your website ready to take on 2016? If not, we can help. We're WebsiteDesigners.com. And if you need help getting noticed this holiday season, we can help. WebsiteDesigners.com makes beautiful websites, landing pages, logos, and everything else that will get eyes on your business. No matter what your online branding needs are, we have you covered. So make 2016 your best year yet with fresh, affordable, yet professional web design work from WebsiteDesigners.com. Now you can enjoy wine the right way with Uva. This beautiful wine decanter aerates your wine at six different levels. Unlike traditional decanters, the Uva uses breakthrough technology that recreates up to six hours of aeration in a single pour. The Uva makes the perfect gift. Buy it now with this special offer code through Amazon.com. What is it? It's a shielding lotion. It's dry skin's biggest threat. Gloves in a bottle shielding lotion helps lock in moisture while blocking out the harmful toxins we encounter every day. With my job using antibacterial agents and latex gloves, my skin suffers. So gloves in a bottle has been the ultimate solution. I've been prescribing it for 20 years now. It's one of the few products where people come back to me and they say, thank you, thank you for referring this product to me. Gloves in a bottle, your skin's invisible shield. Hi, welcome to the Red Booth Show. On tonight's episode, I have musician Tommy Vext. He talks about his band and his new album that's coming out, as well as music videos and some really cool stories about being sober and helping people get off drugs. So come and join us. Okay, welcome to the show, everybody. We are here with musician Tommy Vex. So, how have you been? I know you've been up to a lot of cool things lately. I'm good. I'm good. I've been, yeah, busy. Things are good. Um, you know, uh, my new band, Westfield Massacre, uh, which also features Tim Young from Divine Heresy. We were both in that band together, and Bill Hudson from Trans Siberian Orchestra. No way. That's awesome. yeah, yeah. We're we're um, we're om we're about. Two songs away from finishing, completing the entire first record. Um, we have signed a deal with a record label. I can't say who. Um, there'll be an official press release, and we're scheduling for a release in March of 2016. And exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. We had a, had a meeting with the director. Uh, Steven Steelman is going to be directing our... He did our last music video for Darkness Divides, and we're going to be, I think, in, the, in January, we're going to film two videos back-to-back. In Las Vegas, so Ooh, probably Vegas. right after, yeah. Well, hi everyone in Las Vegas. Did you know my show actually airs in Las Vegas too now? There you go. So we might need extras. So check, <laughs> follow us on Instagram and Facebook, and because yeah. we're calling for people. Sweet. Well, I'll definitely put some links on the show for you to go find their band afterwards. So, Rad. so yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Well, okay, good. So you're going to be doing some new music videos to go with your new album. Mm -hmm. And what would you say the style of your new, your sound is for this band? Well, Tim and I kind of have like a signature sound, you know, we, we kind of, in, in 2007, we came out with Bleed the Fifth, which is the first Divine Heresy record, and, um, you know, it's just like very, really extremely fast, but we also have a lot of melodic parts, you know, and um, I think we've, we've capitalized on that, but I think working with Bill, um, such an amazing shredding guitar player, there's a lot more room for like really intricate solo work, and um, I mean, you know, and, and our the riffs are just... I think we just kind of took the idea of what we used to, we had done, you know, in 2007 and kind of like, I don't know, put it on steroids. So it made nice. it a little more technical and, uh, you know, it's it's some of my favorite work that I've done to date. So I'm excited for everybody to hear it. Yeah, it should be rad. Fantastic. Yeah. You got to <laughs> evolve. I always say musicians need to make music no matter what else you're doing. You know, you got to stay creative and, and then things evolve on their own. So, yeah. So in this band, what would you say that you do? I know, uh, like, are you 
writing all the songs? Or you, like... <laughs> in this band, I do. Uh, I, like, I'm not... I, I guess I'm managing the band, too. Um, so, like, I kind of I kind of do everything. You know, I work with the with Tim and Bill on constructing the songs, putting them together. You know, the guys will come with to me with, like, a, a musical composition of multiple parts. And then I'll listen to it, and we decide what's the verse, what's the chorus. I'll write melodies that'll turn into the chorus. You know, and then... Um, you know, and I'm just very, I'm very involved in, in like the album process of like which song goes where, and you know, I I brought in some like some kind of symphonic like stringed instruments and stuff, and like I want it to be like a movie almost, the experience of the record where it's like this like larger than life thing. So I'm I'm in the studio. And I work with Joseph McQueen at Atlantic. Um, nice. And he, yeah, he has a studio called Echelon Studios. It's not too far from here, and um, cool. he's just he's amazing. And we just kind of go in there and like, you know, we we kind of come up with the, uh, well, I don't know, it's like George Lucas. Like when you make a record, this you know, there are some some guys like come in, they want to do their stuff and get out of there, and they're cool with that. But I'm I think I'm a workaholic and obsessive compulsive. I'm like, oh, I heard of this thing, and you gotta put this bell here, and you know, so that's not bad. See, people could maybe have like a funny connotation about it, and then but it's like actually you're being a perfectionist and you're trying to make it perfect for what you want. So that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't think anything can ever be perfect, but it can get close. Right. And close is good enough. Yeah. That's awesome. And I know that you've been doing music for a long time, so I thought it'd be cool to sort of talk about your history a little bit. Sure. Um, you've been in a bunch of well, a few different bands before. I and have been. One of the most notable, I think, it was definitely Snot. That was pretty. Yeah, cool. absolutely. That's that was like one of my. Uh, that was a dream job, you know, and. Um, you know, for people who don't know, Snot is this like epic punk rock metal band from Santa Barbara, and they came out in the mid to late '90s. And I was a huge fan. Like I was a huge fan. I was living. I grew up in New York, and I used to cut school to like when the band would come to town and show up to yeah. their shows and like hang out. And um, I was just very heavily influenced by Lynn Strait as a vocalist. And so, you know, in 2008 when they were doing auditions for the reunion. Um, Mikey called me and uh, I showed up and a couple weeks later I was in the band and it was just, uh, it was rad. It was really, really great. And Sonny Mayo is still one of my best friends. He's like family to me to this day. And, you know, it's it's been a great experience going up there and, uh, you know, getting to, it's like the movie Rockstar with Mark Wahlberg, except <laughs> I'm not as good looking as Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> and, um... You know, it's just like, you know, it's like the greatest gig. You get to go up there and play the songs that you, like, I was jamming to as a kid in, you know what I mean, in my closet, screaming into a brush, you know, like, you know, yeah. all angry. And then it's like, then it's real. And, um, you know, I did I did that with those guys up until last, I think it was November of last year, of 2014. And Westfield Massacre started taking off, and um, I, I had got a, a really good job and I couldn't go on tour and so I kind of you know I, I kind of couldn't go out with the band and they wound up hiring my friend Carl who's this amazing singer and um Carl actually was in a band Instinct of Aggression who toured with Snot when I was in the band oh wow and so they had Carl uh essentially come in and, and replace me yeah okay. and replace me um and then you know they've been doing it's been great you know they're they're able to like tour Europe and like go to all these other territories I think they're going to Japan and Australia next year and I finally got to see them for the first time at Knot Fest a couple weeks ago and it was awesome because I hadn't seen Snot perform since Lynn was in the band when I was you know when I was a teenager kid, yeah yeah and so it was really awesome and it's just you know it's just a it's a great family vibe and there's so much history to that band and so many people love that band you know yeah um I remember in the 90s when Snot came out and, like, you know, all of my friends and, like, people, we listened to a lot of, like, death metal and metal and all sorts of rock and all sorts of things. And then Snot was, like, immediately people thought, well, for one thing, the name was hilarious, right? Yeah, yeah. So that just, like, they would just be passing around the album. And actually, to this day, even some of my kids love Snot and, like, listen to their album. So It's so rad. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, they really, what they were doing, uh, they were pushing a lot of boundaries in, back then. And, you know, I think that, I think... That time period in the '90s for LA, there was a there was a lot of bands that were sounding different. You know, there were bands like the System of a Down and the Deftones and Corn 
and snot and like they're supposedly from like this new metal genre but it's not really a genre it's not rap metal it's not really anything each one of those bands have their own sound you know and that's something that uh that i miss you know and so hopefully like what i want to do is like kind of take that my experience and my knowledge and from being in that band and you know their kind of mentality about having a sound that's their own identity and continuing to forge our own identity with Westfield Massacre and kind of do something that's not exactly the same as everybody else, you know? Yeah, that's so, really cool. Yeah, yeah. And the, so the name of your band is Westfield Massacre, so that's obviously the, the mall shooting thing. That's yeah. Like, so how did you guys decide to go with this name? Um, I mean, how did Marilyn Manson come up with Marilyn Manson? It's like, <laughs> what's the worst thing we can do, you know? <laughs> Like it's metal. I mean, it's not you know, it's yeah. not it's not really brain surgery. Um, <laughs> and it's and you know, actually, there is no Westfield massacre. Like, right. but that's the thing. Like the it's it's kind of like word association, and you know, it's because the Westfield malls here and in, in yeah. So well, there's Westfield there's Westfield malls everywhere, and there's like there's a bunch of different towns called Westfield with Westfield high schools, and it just kind of ties in, and and really, it is like. You know the the band is lyrically is a, is a lot about positivity and it's a lot about um, overcoming addiction and mental health and like persevering persevering through life and trying to find a place for yourself. You know that's right. Um, and so you know it's I'm not afraid to tackle uncomfortable subject matter like things like school shootings and you know it's like it's becoming an epidemic and. I agree, man. It's really big. It's a huge problem. It's crazy. Well, the, I think that I think a lot of the, a lot of it is is that kids are getting more and more introverted, and um, you know, young people don't ha- don't necessarily have an outlet, and they also don't have a safe space too. Like you can essentially be bullied now in your own home over the computer, you know, and also like younger generations, the internet is reality to them because what happens on there, they go into their social settings, and it's this, and it exists. As for us, you know, we. I remember like going and knocking on my friend's door and calling for the, you know, and and so, you know, when that, when you really feel like threatened and attacked, you know, or bullied and, uh, I think that people lash out, you know, and it's, and not enough people are listening, you know, not, not asking these kids what's going on. And well, I mean, I don't know what you think about this, but I, I also think that the amount of like drugs and stuff that's, that's happening in society, especially with the youth is a big part of the problem too. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been, uh, I, I'm sober, and I've been, I've... I've Congratulations. Just, thanks. <laughs> I I mean, it, did, it didn't work for me, you know? Like, it's, uh, you know, I did the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing, and, like, I kind of hit a wall almost seven years ago, and, um, you know, I don't know how much, you know, addiction, it's, a, it's classified as a disease, you know? And I don't know how much alcoholism and drug addiction has anything to do with you know kids acting out violently i there's a lot of things i can't attest to because i don't know what it's like to take fucking bath salts and i don't there's like all these hallucinogenic well, drugs i don't really know about there's also all these meds that the kids get given at like at school too which is question i feel is questionable so yeah i mean you know i we deal with that i mean i'm uh, essentially i'm a sober companion which is like i do one on work work like as a drug and alcohol counselor um that's amazing with people yeah it's a great job um but you know you do see a lot of that stuff uh where i i can understand when somebody's coming off opiates or somebody's coming off like a major drug addiction or they're already on prescription medications that they're not prescribed to take and they're taking them in volume that you have to take you know psychotropic drugs to like to be okay like mood stabilizers and things but i think i think also, we live in a prescription nation where prescription drugs are so easily accessible to kids. You yeah. know, anybody with a grandparent knows how to get, you know, Vicodin and whatever, you know, like. Yeah. Um, well, and, they're uh, doing, they would do Ritalin and like uh, other drugs like that too as street drugs too. Yeah. And so, yes. Yeah, so, and then, you know, there's like this, I don't know, America has this like thing of diagnosing kids like ADHD and like all these yeah. hypertension disact like disorders and here take this pill you know and it's like we're fighting a war on drugs and but the war on drugs is kind of at home too you know man i have to give you a high five for that one <laughs> <It's> <laughs> homeland insecurity it's crazy yeah. it's really uh just too much so 
But I, I just have to tell you how awesome it is, I think, that you're working with people to get sober and stuff, because I know in the music industry, just from people I know that are, you know, musicians and, and artists and stuff, that there's so much drug abuse. And there's people, I know people who just recently, like, had someone die from heroin. And, like, it's not it's not uncommon, you know? So it's actually, it is a real problem for, for artists, I think, how much, how much it exists in this field. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, uh, the, the addiction is, is, uh, Addiction and alcoholism is is a heartbreaking thing. You know, it destroys everybody around it. You know, anyone whose life touches the sufferer suffers, you know. And um, I don't think it's exclusive to musicians and artists, but I know that artists and musicians tend to, tend to be people that have a propensity to be more emotional. Mm -hmm. And addicts and alcoholics want to control their emotions with substance. And a lot of the times, like, we've experienced pain and we have trauma and um, a lot of childhood stuff, and sometimes not, sometimes for seemingly no reason. It could be biological, um, but, it, but in any event, at some time within, you know, using, goes from being recreational to being dependent, you right. know, and there are, there's a dependency there physically and, and I think mentally as well, um, you know, and so I, I don't know. I think that it's more publicized, like, you know, Scott, Scott Weiland died, and... Um, you know, the, like the reports are coming in that, you know, they, you know, somebody in the band was arrested and they found, you know, there was cocaine on the bus and they haven't, you know. And unfortunately, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's tragic and heartbreaking that people who have so much talent and give so much to this world, um, they suffer and die because of this thing, you know. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's too much. I mean, it's just too much. Yeah. And um you know the thing is, is that it's an, the sad, the saddest part about it is that it's an unoriginal story. It's not original. You know how many, you know how many more people have to die? Like you know we're burying people all the time. Um, you know, and I, just out of respect, I don't want to name names, but like you know we can go down the list of people, in just in the past five years, and um, and great bands like so much talent and finally getting success and and um, you know they OD and and it's. Um, it's just, it's unoriginal, you know, it's like, and the thing is that there are, the upside is, is that in recovery, there's a lot of artists and people who are in recovery who are, you know, who are coming out of overdosing and going to treatment and like getting involved in the, their community or getting involved in 12-step programs and like turning their lives completely around, but you don't really hear about it, you yeah. know, and so kind of that's kind of like that's kind of how I'm involved with SFG and um the St. Francis group which is like a musicians sober men's group and you know we Yeah, and don't you didn't you work with another group that you were telling me about that the other guys um, yeah, in well, your band? Yeah, well in 2013 we start we started a non-profit organization called SFG 12 which is the St. Francis group 12 which started out as it was 12 members of um 12 members in the music industry who were all um, sober and who have been are you know in recovery, and you know we, it just started out as a thing where we would like help people get to meetings if they were on tour and this that the other, and then it kind of evolved into throwing benefit concerts, and then my old bandmate uh, Sonny, who is um, Sonny played guitar in Snot Seven Dust. Uh, he's currently plays guitar in Ugly Kid Joe. Nice. He teamed up with Wes Gear, and Wes is from the original guitar player of Head PE. And he played in corn for I think about five years. He was Amazing. in corn. And they started Rock to Recovery. And Rock to Recovery is a music program that goes into um, rehabs and sober livings and they basically do music therapy. And so they they go into places and give people instruments and like help them write songs. And a lot of times in these places, there people who are in rehab actually are already musicians. Wow. You know, and so, you know, they do a lot of good work and they do a lot of work with the Wounded Warriors Foundation, and so, Very you know, cool. it's like these are the things that, like those, to, those, those are the that's you know you can die on your tour bus, um, or you can turn it around, yeah, and do something that affects other people's lives with your life, and like those guys are the kind of people who inspire me, and I'm you know I'm grateful to know them. Amen you know? to that, man. Well, yeah. I'm really really happy that you talked about that on the show because. I've definitely had people come on the show and talk about going sober because, you know, you don't need to be um, on drugs and abusing your body to be an artist. It's just, you don't need to do it. Well, and I think it's an, it's an old stigma that's romanticized and like, you know, the reality is, is that for me, my creativity exploded 
when I got on the other side of being dependent on chemicals. You know, a lot of people think their greatest fear is that I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to get on stage. I'm not going to be able to... Once you actually... You know, you don't know what it's going to be like until you've done it. And so once you walk through and pass through the other side of the fear of um, of having the same experience but without being, you know, anesthetized being to sober. a certain level, yeah, yeah. Um, you realize, like, how much more control you have over it and how much more freedom and how much more fun. You know, it's, it's just... I, I live a very deeply gratifying life, you know, and I'm, like, extremely blessed, you know... <laughs> I can't even recognize my life to what it was, you know, 10 years ago. And uh, it really is a result of making those kind of life decisions and, like, you know, staying with the winners, being with people who, like, who want to, like, leave this world better than the way that they came into it, you know. That's so freaking awesome. Thank you for, for doing that and for thinking that's important because it is. It really is. It's a very important message. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how I feel. <laughs> that's my truth. We didn't even know we were going to get like so deep today on the show, but it just kind of <laughs> happened. But it's really yeah. important. It's a really big deal. So, so, so kudos, man, for doing that. Just being an open book. Yeah. And if people do want to get help, um, do you want, do you have a place that they should check, check out their... Yeah. I mean, there is a, uh, our site, the, the site kind of went, went dead because everybody's uh, work schedules. Um, but there's a, you can look up rocktorecovery.com. Okay. And, um, you know, there's Rock to Recovery is on Facebook. And, cool. You know, uh, you know, or just hit me up. It's it's kind of interesting that, like, just through social media, yeah. I've, I, have, I have tons of people every year just hit me up and ask me where to yeah. go. And, you know, I'll send them to, like, uh, I'll give them phone numbers for rehabs. And I know. just have to mention a rehab that I uh, I know people that have gone to and, and done really well with is is called Narconon and they actually don't use a lot of they don't don't, don't use drugs to replace drugs. Oh wow! Okay. So it's kind of cool. I think yeah. that's a good good way to go too. I'm not familiar with them, but now I'm gonna have to look them up. Yeah. All right. Well, you should. Yeah. Anyway, so well, cool. So now back to the creative, fun music stuff that you do. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's all creative and fun. True. That's yeah. true. I I know. I know. It is. Yeah. Helping people is very, very, very fun. So I don't mean to say it that way, but I think the thing is, is that as a musician, as a singer, and a frontman, um, since I was a little kid, all I wanted to do is matter. Um, and so there's that thirst as an artist, like anyone who's truly driven to become a performer or to do this thing, it's within you. You you almost feel like, I'm going to die if I don't do this. And you don't really realize till you get a little more mature that you really just want to matter. And for me, you know, in my job, I have the privilege of feeling like I matter to people. And so that part of me gets fulfilled, you know. And so the the desperation to prove anything through music subsides and I get to just have a clear channel to just be creative and I don't, you know, I'm very lucky I'm on a label. They don't, they trust me and they have no desire for creative control. And um, I'm really lucky and I'm going to make, I get to make what I want the way that I want to. And it's not blocked by any, like, I'm not like, oh, these, I need to do this. You know, I need to make sure that we hit this demographic and then we do this for that and da, da, da. It's not, I'm not looking at it from a businessman standpoint. I'm just like, going to make what I think is rad. I want to make a record for my 16-year-old self. Nice. You know, that's what everyone I that's what everyone should do, I think. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. Very cool. I'm excited for you. It sounds like you have a great situation and, you yeah. know, looking forward to hearing your epic new album. Oh, I hope everybody loves it. It's gonna, <laughs> it's pretty it's very metal. It's like kind of it's a it's like a throwback to all my favorite influences that are in the genre and out of the genre and, you know, I mean, I can't really set like one of the greatest things I always say this like when I look back at my career and I look at the guys that I've played with I'm like one day they're gonna realize like I'm not really that good at singing <laughs> you know what I mean I'm more like a giant brown cheerleader like you know that jumps, jumps around on stage and gets the crowd amped up but it's like you know I get to play with like Bill Bill is one of the greatest guitar players in the world right now you know I I played um, with Vex with Angel Vivaldi you know, he's one of the greatest guitar players right now, you know, and I played with Snot, you know, I played with, you know, members of Fear Factory, I played with members of Morbid Angel, Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and like, it's crazy, you know, it's, awesome. it's cr like, if, if I would have, you know, if I would have gone back and told my 16-year-old self, like, you're going to jam with these dudes, I'd be like, oh, get out of here, you know, <laughs> and it's just cool, man, it's just, uh, I got a lot of, a lot of good perspective on, th on things. That's really, really cool. 
So how did you first get into music in the beginning? How did I get into music? Yeah. Oh, man. I got into music when I was, oh, I don't know, I was like 11 or 12. I can't remember when. How old are you in junior high school? I was a freshman in junior high school, and I didn't want to go. <laughs> I didn't want to, like, I. you could take a shop class. You know, you had to take one of those classes, and chorus was one of them. And so all the hot girls went to the chorus to sing. <laughs> And I, so I went there. You went to the chorus class? <laughs> yeah. And, um, and when I was a little kid, my mother was the, the soloist in the church choir and she would sing the like Christmas solo every year. And so I went into the room and like the teacher started playing piano and was like checking every student to see who could sing. And I just made a note and there, and like everyone was like, oh. And so I started singing then. And then when I was 13 or 14, um, my grandmother's neighbor had played guitar in a heavy metal band and they were like, we need a singer to play our concert. And I was like, I can sing. <laughs> and I like went next door and I sang Stone the Crow from Down. I was like 14. And like, they were like, wow. hold on. And they came running in the room with like a phone, like a pl like there were no cell phones. Yeah. And they're like, sing. And it was like the leader of the band. And I sang and they were like, you're in the band. <laughs> and that was it. And that was it. It was like, I was, and I was obsessed with music. And those guys like taught me how to, how to like write songs. And we came up together. And you know, we. What had, was the name of this band? This band was called Vexed. Okay. Yeah. And so we were like this like hardcore band of like these kids, and we would like play shows in the city. We had fake IDs because we couldn't play CBGBs or any of the venues because we weren't old enough. Aww. So we figured out the system and. You know, we used to rent. We used to take. <laughs> you like, didn't hear that from my show. I know. It was like my my guitar uh. my guitar player. He would take his mom's credit card and like rent a, a a school bus, and then we would give flyers out in in our high schools, and we would put a keg on the school bus, oh. sell tickets to the bus and the show, and come to the go to Manhattan from Brooklyn. And all the club promoters were like, you guys are too young. You can't come in here. And we have got a bus of 150 kids and a stack of money. And they're like. All right, yeah. and that's how, and that's like how it started. So we were, I was hustling from a really young age, and <laughs> we made it work. Amazing. Yeah, we made it work. So we were like, we're gonna play, and people were gonna hear us. And that. <laughs> Meanwhile, all our friends just wanted to get drunk, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like oh, rock and roll, bro, you know. That's so yeah, crazy. I love it. Yeah, it was. Uh, there wasn't a lot of school going on during high school. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of plans. <laughs> well, it all prepared you for your epic musical journey. I guess so, yeah. Yes. I guess so. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. It's rad. Yeah, you're pretty rad. I think I think you're doing... rad. <sighs> <laughs> I totally have that same flower. I just didn't wear it today. You know? <laughs> I know. He's like, he stuck it on. like says, so. It's actually mine. I let her borrow it. Let me borrow it. it. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Oh, girl. <laughs>